Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Michael Atkins. I'm the Deputy Director of the Georgetown Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center and a medical oncologist with a long history of doing clinical and translational research in the melanoma space. And I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. Jeff Gibney, who is a medical oncologist at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital and runs the melanoma program at the MedStar Georgetown Cancer Institute, and Dr. Suthi Rapisawan, who's a medical oncologist based primarily at MedStar Washington Hospital Center and is our leading expert in rare melanoma types. And today we're going to give you three relatively short presentations on some of the work that's being done at Georgetown and within MedStar and across the world um, for advancing melanoma therapy in 2022. Hopefully that will take about 35 to 40 minutes and then we'll have about 20 minutes to take your questions, which hopefully you can provide in the question and answer part while we're um, giving our presentations and then we'll be able to see them and answer them afterwards. Melanoma is a disease that affects about 100,000 patients in the United States every year, and maybe an additional 60,000 cases of melanoma in situ, which don't get usually reported to the tumor registry. There are about 7,500 deaths per year. It represents 5% of all cancers and about 1% of all cancer deaths. So we do a lot better in treating melanoma overall than many other cancers. It's the fourth most common cancer in men and fifth most common in women. And its incidence is increasing, but interestingly enough, the death rate is decreasing faster than all other cancers. So why is the death rate decreasing from early detection and better treatments as we'll talk about today. And currently 90 to 95% of patients diagnosed with melanoma are cured of their disease. So historically, um, melanoma, particularly metastatic melanoma was uh, considered a bad cancer. Maybe the cancer that gives cancer a bad name because its uh, mortality was increasing compared to other cancers Median survival, meaning half the people lived uh, uh, only at six to nine months in most studies, and less than 10% of patients were alive at two years. And prior to 2011, there were few, if any, effective therapies and none that prolonged survival. And this is a um, what we call a survival curve, which you'll see a lot of these, which shows percent alive um, on the uh, y-axis and survival time in year on the x-axis. And as you can see for stage four melanoma, which is metastatic melanoma, the curve falls fast and about 10% of patients are alive at 10 years. So since 2011, there's been really a revolution in melanoma therapy, which included targeting molecular changes within the tumor, particularly BRAF and MEK inhibitors and immune checkpoint inhibitors, particularly antibodies against CTLA-4 and PD-1. So I'm gonna talk about those. So the initial development was um, development of BRAF inhibitors. And this is a picture of a patient with melanoma with a lot of subcutaneous metastases as well as disease throughout his body, who was very sick. And then he received a single agent BRAF inhibitor. And within a few months, you could see that all of these metastatic lesions were shrinking and the patient was getting healthy. But unfortunately, a few months after that, the tumor developed resistance and the disease came back. So fortunately, we were able to show in research that if you block the BRAF pathway at two different points, at BRAF and at MEK, 
you can prolong the benefit and also decrease the toxicity. And so there were three studies that showed that combination of BRAF and MEK inhibitors were better than single agent BRAF inhibitors alone. And here are the three different combinations and each of them showed about a reduction of 45 to 50% in, um, in the rate of progression of the disease. So all of them are pretty similar and therefore we make decisions about who gets treatment based on side effects. And as you can see that uh, vemurafenib and cobimetinib have a higher rate of photosensitivity while dibrafenib and trametinib have a higher rate of fevers, and encobini has a low rate of both fevers and pyrexia, continuous dosing with no refrigeration, long uh, dissociation half-life for BRAF, and the best of the median PFS, while dibrafenib and trametinib appear to be the best in um, are approved for the treatment of patients with brain metastases and also in the adjuvant setting. And if you look at Debraf and the Tremetinib, you can identify that not all patients do the same. Patients in particular who have um, a normal blood LDH, a small amount of tumor involving less than three sites have a much better prognosis than patients with an elevated LDH, this green curve, and about 83% of these favorable risk patients will have tumor shrinkage, and that's uh, significant, and about 40% will have the tumor go completely away, and in those patients where it goes completely away, about 71% of those patients will be alive at five years. So the other thing I wanted to talk about in this revolution in melanoma therapy, which was is immunotherapy, which is a true revolution in cancer therapy that has been led by developments in melanoma. And all to understand immunotherapy, you have to realize that all cancers have mutations. This is a plot which shows various cancer types and the number of mutations per megabase of DNA. And as you can see that um, there's a difference in the number of mutations with melanoma being the most mutated. And these mutated proteins represent potential antigens, which are targets for immune recognition and destruction. And the host immune system is the dominant active enemy faced by any developing cancer. And therefore, all successful cancers must have a way to evade or disable the host immune system. And when we give immunotherapy, it treats the immune system so that it can once again attack the cancer. And because the immune system and the immune response can broaden and deepen over time, immunotherapy can eliminate the last tumor cells producing cures, which is instead of just targeting one pathway, it can sort of machine gun the, um, the tumor so it can't escape. And these cures are manifest by plateaus on those survival curves. So the principal immune therapy that we use to activate, reactivate the body's immune system is a blocker of PD-1. And the way this works is when the immune system recognizes a protein on the surface of the tumor, it makes interferon, which upregulates on the tumor something called PD-L1, which binds to PD-1 on the immune cell and shuts the immune cell off. And these antibodies, which block either PDL1 or PD1, block this interaction, restoring the function of the immune response. And it's therefore no surprise that the tumors with the more mutations appear to be the ones that are more likely to respond to anti PD1. And the first anti PD1 approved is pembrolizumab or Keytruda. And here's an example of an early patient on a CT scan, which had this large mass in the lung and also in the liver and getting single agent anti-PD-1 with pembrolizumab had dramatic tumor shrinkage that continues to this day. So another um, checkpoint inhibitor is CTLA-4 and CTLA-4 
These properties were discovered by Jim Allison, who won the Nobel Prize for that discovery, along with Dr. Hanjo here, who won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of anti-PD-1. And putting these two uh, blockers together enhances the anti-tumor effects. And if you want to learn a little bit about the discovery of CTLA-4, there's a movie out about this called The Breakthrough, um, and it's actually quite compelling story, so I encourage you to watch that. I think you can get it on Netflix. So when you combine the two in a study that was uh, uh, sponsored by BMS uh, and um, first presented about seven years ago, you could see that the combination produced a 5% improvement in progression and a 7% improvement in overall survival at six and a half years. But at our institution, the data was even better where we see a higher uh, tail of the overall survival curve for the combination of NEVO and IPI, anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4, compared to single agent anti-PD-1. And even though this combination is associated with a lot more toxicity than just a single agent anti-PD-1 toxicity that is immune reactions uh, against normal tissues that for the most part can be shut off with immunosuppressive drugs. It's interesting that in our database across our um, cancer network, the patients who have more toxicity or experience toxicity actually have greater benefit, anti-tumor benefit than the patients who have no toxicity. And even if you get immunosuppressive drugs um, to block the toxicity, it doesn't seem to interfere with that benefit. So uh, in around 2015, we um, had um, BRAF MEK inhibitors, which tended to splay the overall survival curve and combination nevo ipi which tended to raise the tail of these curves, the plateau of these curves. And the question was, which is preferred and because patients would have access to both treatments, is there an optimal sequence? So to address this question, we carried out a trial in the cooperative group, which um, randomized patients to either uh, Nevo-Ipi, uh, combination immunotherapy, followed by dabrafenib trametinib at progression versus the inverse sequence. And what we saw was that these curves, these overall survival curves initially crossed at 10 months with the immunotherapy first curve being above the targeted therapy first curve thereafter. And at the two year time point, there was actually a 20% difference in the number of patients who were alive if they started with immunotherapy first. And so because of this, um, now around the world, patients who can get either therapy will likely get immunotherapy first based on this study, which, which I led. So one of the reasons why immunotherapy does well is because it produces these durable responses. And another reason is because it works as well in the central nervous system, at least for asymptomatic or not visible central nervous system metastases as it does in systemic disease. And therefore, we're not seeing these isolated relapses in the central nervous system. And if you wanna read a compelling story um, from one of our patients about um, her treatment of her melanoma CNS metastases, I'll refer you to this book, The Neuroscientist Who Lost Her Mind by uh, Dr. Barbara Lipska, who may actually be on this call. So what was nice about combination immunotherapy is it accomplishes the patient's preferred outcome, which is that the treatment can end, usually somewhere uh, at a year or less, but the benefit can persist. And what this does um, is um, turn our survivors into thrivers who are unleashed from their oncology clinic and free to travel the world and um, 
check off things on their bucket list and attend milestone events for their families. And it's for someone who started treating melanoma when almost everybody died, having a clinic full of thrivers is really a rewarding experience. So future studies with uh, single agent anti-PD-1, we're trying to develop predictive biomarkers for who can respond to single agent. And as Dr. Gibney will talk about, we're looking at these agents in trying to prevent relapse in patients with surgically resected disease. And um, this, I think, will be a way in which we can um, further raise the bar. But we're also looking at anti-PD-1s as a backbone for combination studies. And there are now more than a couple of thousand combination studies looking at PD-1 plus other types of agents in various cancers be taking place around the world. Um, and um, because anti-PD-1s are showing activity in not just melanoma, but at least 20 other types of cancer. And one of those initial studies to show benefit are the combining of uh, anti-PD-1 with an anti-LAG-3, which as shown here, shows improvement in PFS, potentially similar to what we're seeing with the combination of CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1. And this combination is now an FDA-approved combination as well. So the next steps are to determine which patients to treat with particular anti-PD-1 regimens, um, treatments for checkpoint inhibitor and targeted therapy resistant patients, and moving treatments to the adjuvant and neoadjuvant setting, both of these last two, which Dr. Gibney will talk about, and improving therapy for patients with variant melanoma, particularly uveal melanoma, which Dr. Rapisawan will talk about. And in doing so, our goals should not be, in my view, to turn melanoma into a chronic disease, but we should strive to make melanoma a curable disease. And with all of these advances over the past decade, that dream is becoming a reality. So I'll stop there and just show a picture of our melanoma program in our beautiful new lobby at the Lombardi Cancer Center. And um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Gibney. Well, thank you, Dr. Atkins. That's a wonderful introduction to melanoma and certainly leads the way for the presentation that I'm about to start here. So I am going to be discussing um, a subtopic in melanoma, uh, as well as a few new uh, approaches. So this will be the adjuvant therapy, uh, as well as clinical trials that we'll, we're involved with here at Georgetown. Uh, these are just some disclosures, um, but the outline that we're going to talk about is really adjuvant and neoadjuvant therapy. So what is it? Why do we give it? And is it more effective to give treatment before a patient goes to surgery? And then we're going to spend the last part of the 15 minutes that I was going to be presenting um, to talk about promising new treatment approaches for high-risk and advanced melanoma. So I know most of us are familiar with this, but it's a, a good starting place just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, but stages of melanoma are, are very important to think about. Not everyone presents with stage four disease. In fact, most patients present with stage one or two disease. Uh, and that's where the melanoma is started somewhere in the skin most often. And it, it usually starts off growing radially, so out, and then it grows down. As it grows down, it becomes more aggressive and is higher risk. Um, when it spreads beyond that area, it will travel through what we call lymphatics uh, to draining lymph nodes. Uh, in this example, where the melanoma is located on the forearm, it could go to, towards the elbow where, where it's in the antecubital fossa, or it could go to the, the armpit uh, where you have lymph nodes in what we call the axilla. Uh, that would be considered stage three where those tumor cells have migrated, they're metastasizing, but they haven't spread throughout the body yet. Uh, and then we have stage four. Stage four is when the tumor cells spread beyond that. They may be spreading in the bloodstream and even bypass the lymph nodes. So they could travel and land in the lung or liver. Um, they could also go from lymph node to lymph node and end up somewhere more central, such as in the abdomen and pelvis or somewhere in the chest. Uh, when we think about stage one, two, and three, these are what we consider usually surgical cases where patients should go to surgery with the intent to cure them 
by physically removing the disease. Um, cure rates are very high, or the survival rates, I should say, are very high for many patients with stage one, two, and some patients with stage three. Uh, however, there are patients with stage one and two disease where the survival is not what we would like it to be, where the recurrence rate can be 20% or higher. That's where we see the melanoma is, is deeper um, or it has an ulcer on, on the surface of it. And if you look at the lower part there at stage 2C, uh, we see that melanoma survival at 10 years is only 75% for those patients. So certainly a, a group of patients that we're worried about and we'd like to do more. Uh, stage three, there's quite a range where patients can do quite well, uh, as in that green bar where it's stage 3A, that's where there's very limited amount of tumor that's spread to a lymph node. Um, when you have more disease, where you have multiple lymph nodes involved and there may be something that you can palpate, that's where we start getting to the higher stages with stage uh, 3C and 3D, having survival numbers that make us even more concerned. Uh, these are patients where after surgery, uh, we wanna do more than just watch and wait. And, and that term of active surveillance is great, but we want to do something more pro, uh, preemptively. And this is where drug therapy comes into play. Uh, we now have multiple drugs that initially were studied and approved in the widespread setting. And now we give to patients in the adjuvant setting. So after surgery, we're now giving them these drugs to reduce the risk of recurrence. In stage two disease, we have the immunotherapy drug pembrolizumab. Uh, in stage three disease, we have two uh, anti-PD-1 immunotherapies, that's pembrolizumab or nivolumab, both very similar. And then we have targeted therapy for the BRAF mutant tumors, uh, that's dibrafenib trametinib. Uh, we also have drugs that we can use if you had a stage four tumor that was removed and no evidence of other disease. Uh, and there has been an approval for nivolumab, or sorry, for ipilimumab, although its use is uh, fairly limited given that it is not quite as effective as the other drugs and there's more toxicities, more side effects. So to look into some of this data, uh, this is from the study called Keynote 716 in patients with high-risk stage two disease. So they underwent surgery and then they participate in this study where they were randomized to either receive the immunotherapy drug pembrolizumab or a placebo, and it was blinded. So patients and doctors didn't know what the, the treatment course was. And as you can see uh, in this survival curve of recurrence-free survival, that teal curve uh, are the patients that got treated with pembrolizumab, and it sits at a higher level, meaning that there's fewer recurrence events. Uh, at the 18 month mark, there was 86% of patients that were recurrence-free compared to only 77% of patients who got the placebo. Uh, this is meaningful in our eyes. If you translate this into what we call a hazard ratio, you see a reduction in the recurrence rate pretty significantly. Um, there's another way we look at this from the hazard ratio where we would invert it. And we would say this reduces the recurrence risk by 39% in a patient who's being treated with pembrolizumab. Uh, so this is a therapy that we do offer to most patients now. And, was recently approved in the last year. Uh, in stage three patients, we have um, anti-PD-1 therapies that are also making a major difference uh, when we're given in the adjuvant setting, so to reduce the recurrence risk. Uh, in this study, Keynote 054, uh, patients were randomized to either receive pembrolizumab, the same drug, or placebo. Um, this is a year of treatment. And you can see that the recurrence-free survival is clearly higher, clearly greater in patients who receive pembrolizumab. At the 36-month mark, we had 64% of patients that were recurrence-free compared to 44% who were on the placebo arm. Uh, this translates to a reduction recurrence risk of 44%. So when I see patients with resected stage three disease, and we're talking about what they can do to improve their outcomes or lower the chances of the cancer coming back, this is a drug, uh, that we would talk about, and we would talk about in the context of how it would reduce the recurrence risk by almost half. Now, we have to keep in mind these drugs are not benign. Uh, they are overall well tolerated, but about 17% of patients treated with pembrolizumab, at least in the Keynote 716 study, had a what we'd consider a significant or major side effect. These tend to be immune side effects, could be inflammation in the skin or bowel, uh, they are treatable. We hold drug. We give steroids as the antidote in many cases. 
Um, and patients, as Dr. Atkins was alluding to, do not need to stay on the drugs permanently. So even if they come off uh, due to side effects, there's still the potential to have all the benefit. The one thing that we do want to point out is that not every patient who has resected disease is going to relapse. And if you do a drug therapy, then that patient that was not destined to relapse might end up with a side effect that could be serious or even permanent, such as hypothyroidism. That bar all the way off to the left shows that 15% of patients in the study ended up with hypothyroidism and potentially uh, needed to have a hormone replacement pill for the rest of their lives. Now that's manageable, but uh, if we knew that they didn't need the therapy in the first place, obviously we would like to avoid it. Now, these rec uh, recurrence risks are still high, even with drug therapy in the adjuvant setting, trying to prevent the recurrence. So we clearly want to do better. Not only do we want to identify the patients that need the therapy, but we also want the therapy to be more effective. Uh, Dr. Atkins, in one of his last slides, discussed the new approval of nivolumab and relatlimab. These are anti-PD-1 and anti-LAG-3 immunotherapies. These are proteins or antibodies that bind to targets on T cells that are exhausted, reinvigorates them, and hopefully those T cells will eliminate the hiding tumor cells. Uh, this is an ongoing study, the Relativity 098 study, uh, where patients with resected stage 3 to 4 disease would be eligible. To be randomized to either the standard treatment, which would an anti-PD-1 drug alone, nivolumab, or to get the new combination. And we're in the process of opening this at Georgetown, so hopefully in the next few weeks, we actually will be able to offer this to patients who uh, present with newly uh, resected stage three or four disease. Now, we also have patients with uh, disease or melanoma that can be surgically removed, um, but it's a fairly large volume. And uh, this is where we um, consider maybe giving drug therapy up front before surgery, and that's called neoadjuvant treatment. Uh, the benefits potentially for doing this is you can shrink the tumor. That may make the surgery easier, less morbid, less complications. It may uh, be more effective eliminating tumor cells that have already spread or micrometastases. Um, in the world of immunotherapy, we also think that giving immune therapy drugs while the tumor is still in place might be more effective than after it's been removed, that the immune system might be revved up to a higher level and be more effective clearing out all the hiding disease if you have that engagement. Uh, there's also the opportunity to study new treatments, new combinations and learn from them very quickly. And that can help uh, future patients. And then there's also the key point that we can measure response if the tumor is still there. We cannot measure response if we've taken it all out. So if you get a, a dose or two of a drug before you go to surgery and you see tumor shrinkage, that has a potential to predict future outcomes for that patient. Uh, and this comes from a, a number of studies, including this pool data set um, from an international neoadjuvant melanoma consortium, where it was pooling data from a number of studies of immunotherapy as well as targeted therapy. And if patients um, who went to surgery after getting a month to two months of, of treatment, their tumor showed that there was what we call a um, pathologic complete response. So even though the tumor, there was something to remove under the microscope, it was all dead tissue. If you saw that, the survival was excellent in those patients. Recurrence-free survival at 24 months was 89%. So almost 90% of patients are uh, recurrence-free. But if patients didn't show that response at time of surgery, the recurrence rates were much higher. So almost double. So this is a way of telling who is likely to be a long-term survivor and not see a relapse by giving the drug up front and testing the response. Uh, we do have an ongoing trial at Georgetown that Dr. Rapasuan is our uh, principal investigator for, where we're using a novel anti-PD-1 drug uh, from Tessero, and it's either given alone for two doses, or it's given in combination with a new immune therapy drug that targets a marker called TIM3. TIM3 also leads to T cell inhibition or exhaustion. So giving it together with the anti-PD-1 drug might make it more effective. All patients go on to surgery and then complete the standard one year of treatment that we'd be giving to most patients anyways. And this is hopefully really where the field is moving and we'll learn a lot from this study and we may be able to make major improvements in, in the patient outcomes with these types of approaches. So I'm gonna shift uh, for the last few slides to, to patients with uh, more active disease, widespread disease. And this was a, a figure that was shown by Dr. Atkins uh, from nivolumab, ipilimumab um, in patients with widespread or active melanoma. With this treatment in the Checkmate 067 study, there was over a third of patients who never progressed or at least out 
uh, to the 72 month mark. Uh, this is incredible where patients got a, a, a period of treatment. Maybe they came off for side effects. Maybe they stayed on it for years and, and then they never saw progression. In this study and others, there has not been well-defined duration of treatment. So if someone's on treatment, they're tolerating it well, they're responding, how long do they actually stay on it? And that, this is an area that we're now interested in exploring further. Uh, at Georgetown, we've been looking at these outcomes and we've had a, an approach that we think is very rational, where if you're on treatment with an anti-PD-1 therapy for a year, we've offered PET scans to look to see if any tumor sites might be still active or if there's any hiding tumors. And if there's anything suspicious on the PET scan, we'd offer a biopsy. If the PET scan or biopsy is negative, we've been offering patients to come off treatment to be monitored and see how they do. Uh, typically, we think about this about the 12-month mark. Uh, we've uh, done this a little bit further into treatment for some patients. And as you can see in the data that we've now published, that green curve, that survival curve for event-free survival, at three years off treatment, 95% of patients were still doing well without any change or, or relapse in their disease status. So they were uh, treatment-free, uh, doing well, and hopefully cured of their disease. Uh, we, Dr. Atkins and I are now leading a national study called the EA6192 or PET STOP protocol, where we're trying to establish this approach as standard of care. And this will make a big difference in the way we look at cancer treatment for melanoma and potentially other tumor types where patients who undergo anti-PD-1 therapy with advanced melanoma, uh, if they're doing well a year out, they'll be offered a PET scan. If the PET scan shows any um, activity, they'll get a, a biopsy. If the PET scan was negative or the biopsy was negative for active tumor, then they would discontinue therapy. That's that arm A all the way off to the right. And what we're hoping to prove is that in arm A off therapy at a year, at least 90% of patients are without any change in disease, no relapse, no progression, and that they're doing well. And we think if we achieve that, that will change the way we approach melanoma with anti-PD-1 therapies and establish a new standard of care. Uh, shifting gears towards patients that do not respond to the PD-1 therapy. So uh, we see more than half of patients with a combination will have a response. The majority of them maintain that response, but not everyone benefits. So we do need other therapies. One really exciting therapy is what we call T-cell therapy or adoptive transfer of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And this is where we take a tumor from a patient, we grow the white blood cells that were in the tumor, in the laboratory, we expand them, we make sure they react against the patient's own tumor, and then we expand them up to about a, a few billion cells. We bring the patient to the hospital, we give chemotherapy to temporarily uh, stun the immune system, and then we infuse those T cells right back into the patient. As you can see, it hangs much like a bag of platelets or red blood cells. And then we stimulate them further with a, a medication called interleukin-2. Now, this is a very intensive regimen, uh, but it's been around since the 80s, and we've seen it work before patients were exposed to anti-PD-1 therapies, and now we're seeing it as a salvage regimen for patients that fail to have a good response with anti-PD-1 therapy. Uh, this is a study uh, where the, this process has been commercialized by Iovance, a pharmaceutical company, uh, we've been involved in studies with Iovance as well as another company called Instill Bio, where 36% of patients in this study after a PD-1 failure uh, showed an objective response. Those bars are each a patient and it shows the reduction in their tumor burden. As you can see, more than half, actually 81% of patients had some tumor shrinkage and 36% had what we consider very dramatic tumor shrinkage. The majority of these patients who saw tumor shrinkage it continues on with that very short course of treatment. So with that, I was going to conclude uh, that adjuvant therapies reduce recurrence rates in resected stage one, uh, stage two and stage three melanoma. This is something that we're now offering to all patients. There's emerging approaches with new adjuvant and neoadjuvant treatment uh, strategies. Um, PET CT and biopsy may be an effective biomarker to evaluate for residual active tumor and be a, a way that we can safely discontinue immunotherapy for patients. T cell therapy can produce meaningful responses in patients where anti PD1 therapy failed. And at Georgetown, we're building our program so that hopefully we'll be able to offer this to patients that are looking for other therapies beyond the standard uh, anti PD1 therapies. And uh, if I could just take one slide just to work through just the way I was, I, I've thought about where things are going in immunotherapy or IO immuno oncology for patients. We're looking for durable responses. 
And if every patient um, were able to get an anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4 therapy, that's the Nevoipi, we see good responses or durable responses in about half of patients. So if all of those patients are doing well, then we focus on the other 50% of patients. Um, we have the TIL therapy that works quite well, not in every patient, but if we can get a durable response in 28% of those patients, now there's only 32% of patients looking for a good immunotherapy response. We've done a great job with more than half of the patients at that point. There are new approaches. Um, the LAG3 approach is one uh, approach that we've talked about. So maybe another 10% of those will get a really good immunotherapy response. And then there's about 29% of patients where there's other strategies that we have, whether it's targeted therapy, chemotherapy, or other immunotherapy approaches that are emerging. So hopefully we're gonna to get to a place where we're near 100% where patients with advanced melanoma are gonna do well in the future. So with that, I'm gonna stop. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Suthi Rapasuan, who is going to present on a rare subtype of melanoma uh, called uveal melanoma. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and welcome Suthi. I'm gonna focus on only the uveal melanoma since this is my area of expertise. So uveal melanoma is a rare um, cancer in general. Um, overall, it um, consists of approximately 5% of our melanoma. Um, the incidence is actually pretty even, evenly distributed between the, um, the population, whether it's white, um, African-American, Asian, or Hispanic. And, Within this um, inherited, co inherited cost of uveal melanoma is approximately, is, is approximately one to 2% based on the, um, the germline um, mutation of the gene called BAP, BAP1. So uh, moving, moving on, so what's actually predisposed patient to um, uveal melanoma, although there has been some suggestion that um, the iris melanoma can be um, predisposed by chronic um, UV exposure, approximately up to um, at least for a total duration of 40 years from an Australian study, but those data are still equivocal and people are, not, are still not agreed upon. Um, but in general, um, other precursor lesion can um, um, later lead to development of uveal melanoma, such as a choroidal um, nevus. Um, this is actually a completely benign um, lesion that pre present in about 8% of Caucasian um, population that um, the ocular oncologists or the ophthalmologists often have to uh, uh, monitor um, based on the growth and, uh, and the vertical growth. Um, the other two are uh, typically uh, nevus of Oda, which is uh, the uh, congenital nevus that uh, people are born with. And lastly, the primary acquired melanocytosis are often associated with more of the conjunctival melanoma, which um, in general is not really great upon to be a part of the, uh, the uveal melanoma itself, but um, gears towards more like um, the mucosal melanoma part. So um, the distribution of uveal melanoma, approximately 90% of all uveal melanoma occur in the choroid. Um, and the remaining 10% um, um, usually situated in the iris and the least common site of uveal melanoma is serially body melanoma, although these um, uh, usually um, behave uh, more aggressively compared to the choroidal melanoma itself. Um, the um, very important distinction between um, uveal melanoma and other melanoma is that there tends to be a genetic evolution uh, of the uveal melanoma starting from the, um, the inception or the conception of the uveal melanoma in the eyes and then the um, accumulation of um, chromosomal loss and gain gene mutation within the, the tumor itself. And when you look at within the tumor, um, each different part of the tumor contain different changes um, until like uh, the patient develop metastases. Uh, that's when um, the, uh, the melanoma or uveal melanoma has been like the most aggressive part. So how do we make a staging of uveal melanoma? Um, the uh, conventional um, 
method um, by using the TNM staging, which account for the size and the location of the uveal melanoma has been used in the past, but most re uh, more recently, we've been using the information from both um, anatomical location and characteristic, as well as the, um, the molecular information from the RNA, which is the, uh, the, the um, nucleic acid within the tumor itself, what we did was we actually um, have the ocular oncologist um, do the FNA biopsy um, at the time that they were gonna do um, the treatment, usually with the iodine um, um, treatment, radioactive iodide, or at the type of enucleation. And those information from the FNA biopsy will be sent um, um, to a laboratory so that they extract the RNA and do the gene expression profile. And by doing so, we will get um, um, additional um, um, stratification information by um, um, using a gene expression profile and we classify them into either class one or class two as class two being the more aggressive kind of um, um, uveal melanoma itself. So um, like we said um, earlier that, you know, the rare melanoma tends to do worse than the cutaneous melanoma itself. Um, there's no exception for uveal melanoma that they tend to actually do a lot worse than the cutaneous melanoma, um, just because um, they behave differently, um, they are originated differently, and the um, genetic part um, uh, of behavior is also um, more aggressive. So how do we treat advanced um, uveal melanoma? Um, there are, um, uh, multiple um, study using targeted therapy, but most of the targeted therapy has been quite um, uh, unsatisfactory with a negative test, negative results. Um, this um, um, slide um, show an example of the information from the immunotherapy anti ctoa 4 anti-PD-1 therapy that had previously been quite successful um, in cutaneous melanoma. However, when you reuse it in patients with uveal melanoma, the result has been um, quite um, disappointing with the response rate. Um, pretty low um, with the anti-PD-1 itself, for example, the response rate is about 5%. Um, and, uh, more recently, um, the group at, at MD Anderson, um, led by Dr. Satna Patel, and also the group at the um, um, the European group led by Dr. Purlat, um, also published the data showed the um, efficacy of the uh, epilimumab and nivolumab in advanced uveal melanoma. The response varied between only 11 to 18 percent, as opposed to uh, like the more uh, favorable response in cutaneous melanoma. Uh, um, but um, we still use the ipilimumab and nivolumab in patients with um, um, metastatic uveal melanoma as um, there's no other um, better treatment option. Luckily, in a subset of patients that um, we um, have had a recent um, FDA approval um, of this uh, new medication is called Tabentifus. Uh, what is it? It's actually in, um, a bispecific antibody or what it does is actually um, is a protein that in, on one end, which is a targeting end, would um, um, target on the, um, um, the protein that is expressed um, um, in the HOA restricted way. So HOA is the, um, the protein that um, 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 expressed in all, all of the uh, antigen presenting cells in our body. And um, in this uh, medication, it only um, um, interact with only um, the HLA0201, which um, expressed in about 50% in a Caucasian population and less so in um, African American or Asian population. On the other end, which is the, the effector domain that it um, targeted is anti-CD3, which is a, uh, um, it, it targets CD3, uh, which is the, um, the, the um, cell surface protein or receptor on the T cell. By doing so, it actually engaged the um, polyclonal um, T cell um, towards the, um, the tumor cell and caused the, um, the T cell activation and killing. Um, so this study was presented um, during the, uh, the ASCO meeting uh, last year by Dr. Anthony Shoshore. And, so what it does is actually show uh, uh, the first time in um, um, our um, you know treatment 
and study of a uveal melanoma that improved the overall survival of patients with uveal melanoma in a phase three study where um, the patient were randomized, uh, patient with HLA0201 randomized to either um, um, Tabentipus or um, the um, investigator choice, which mostly primarily consistent of um, anti-PD-1 treatment. So um, the response, although um, the response rate is 9% as opposed to 5% in uh, um, the um, control group, um, we'll see the uncoupling effect of the prolonged overall survival in patients with um, um, U, um, state, uh, advanced uveal melanoma, even for those who actually had a breath best response as progressive disease that they actually do better. Approximately 52% of patients who actually got the IMCGP100 or Tabentifus um, for, from the, um, the treatment, um, which is Tabentifus, um, get to receive approximately seven weeks of the immunotherapy afterwards, as opposed to patients who were on the immunotherapy arm, which is a control arm, that only get approximately um, three weeks um, of the subsequent treatment. So this has been approved by the FDA, I think, if I remember correctly, is in um, February. However, the problem with this study is, uh, not, not a problem actually, the, the problem in general is uh, this treatment is only available to approximately, you know, 50% uh, of our patient that comes in and not for everybody who would uh, uh, be eligible to the treatment based on their HLA um, um, subtype. Um, then like what other treatment option do we have? Um, one other treatment option is the adaptive um, cell therapy that um, has been um, um, shown to show um, some treatment efficacy. Um, one um, study from um, um, Dr. Um, Uday Kamala uh, at now at University of Pittsburgh showed that approximately 25% of patients with um, um, stage four uveal melanoma can actually benefit or response from the adoptive cell therapy or TIL treatment. And in some patient, other treatment options could include the liver directed therapy as well. Um, so then um, as you see that there, there's not a lot of um, um, effective treatment uh, for the patient with uveal melanoma. So therefore, clinical trial um, participation is a key, field, uh, key um, to the future success in the treatment. So what do we have right now? Um, this um, table is um, um, a relatively comprehensive, although not yet all-inclusive um, study in uveal melanoma. In, in, in black are the study that um, are actually currently accruing or almost close to um, finish accrual. Um, study in reds are a study that um, will be coming. Um, uh, for example, um, the, the, the Fox Horn study, FHD um, 280, 286, um, will be using the, um, the, the, the BRAV um, chromatin remodeling complex, um, the ATP is. Um, um, treatment um, um, in a phase one study. And um, another study using the TLR um, um, agonist is the, um, the injectable treatment into the liver itself that will be open into three institution, MD Anderson, Thomas Jefferson, and Columbia University. So um, these are um, some example um, that we have right now. And um, Oops, um, I'm gonna skip this part. Um, so another study that um, we want to mention is um, um, the study at the um, University of Miami by, um, led by Dr. Joselowski uh, um, based on their um, um, preliminary study that they saw that when they looked at the uveal melanoma cell um, through their nucleic acid, they saw that um, within the uveal melanoma cell, there is an increased expression of the protein called um, LAG3. And these LAG3 protein are actually have been like um, more um, widely expressed in um, um, the uveal melanoma cell as opposed to the, um, the PD-1 or CTLA-4 that we um, um, use the antibody that targets them. So uh, with that um, information, um, 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 there's currently an enrolling um, um, study at University of Miami using the um, um, Relatrimab in combination with Nivolumab. And currently, um, 
the study has passed the uh, the current phase of the um, the um, the clinical trial, um, and they are almost um, a finished accrual. And the expectation is that the study would uh, undergo the cohort expansion with a larger multi-center um, study, um, including us um, in the future, hopefully. And this um, study is a basis of our um, next um, um, item that we will talk about. Um, Additional um, treatment uh, available would be the percutaneous hepatic um, PV10, which use a rose, um, the rose bengal, which um, is a small molecule um, inhibitor, um, a small molecule that, in, um, that when injected to the melanoma cell um, in the liver can cause the immunogenic cell death. This study is being led by Dr. Samna Patel. And we, um, um, from the data that we saw, we saw a lot that um, the majority of patients um, achieve at least um, uh, good disease control, um, if not partial response. And uh, um, she will present the data um, at the ASCO meeting this year again. And this is an example um, of the patient who actually responded to the um, PV10. So um, what do we have in an adjuvant clinical trial? Um, um, currently, um, we have, um, um, one adjuvant clinical trial at um, Mr. Georgetown University Hospital that I'm leading with my colleague at other institution using the adjuvant ipilimumab with nivolumab combination. And we have finished the accrual on this um, um, patient population in um, um, September of last year uh, of approximately um, 22 patients. The study is currently um, still um, ongoing, but we are not accruing any new patient. Um, we expect the data to be um, ready for a presentation by next year when uh, the median follow-up approach three years. And additionally, um, in addition to that, um, we will have um, the second cohort, which is a cohort B using relantamab in combination with nivolumab based on the preliminary data uh, that um, Dr. Lutsky and his team uh, um, discover. Um, this um, new cohort is approved by the sponsor and the clinical trial protocol is already finalized. Currently what's pending is the funding. We will plan to uh, enroll approximately 30 patients. We will use the same eligibility criteria as the patient in the first cohort with um, ipilimumab and nivolumab. And the other um, current um, um, adjuvant study that um, um, we have in the country is the adjuvant sunitin with valproic acid that led by Dr. Sado. Um, this um, study is currently um, um, finished um, their accrual in their cohort um, um, three, which um, used the sunitin with um, valproic acid. And the data will be presented um, during the ASCO meeting um, this year. So, um, um, Lastly, which is pretty interesting, um, like um, Dr. Lutsky and his team also is going to open the new um, um, adjuvant study using um, um, the novel medication uh, um, called HDAC inhibitor. Um, um, but, uh, by doing so, um, the HDAC inhibitor, how, how does he discover that? Um, he actually used the library of the um, um, Compound that um, um and can you, can you wrap up? we want to save some time for questions. So. Sure. Um. So um, by using the um the library of molecule that uh, discover the uh, um that the quercetinostat, which is the H dye inhibitor, has the um uh, increased um, um anti tumor activity in the BAP one um um. Um, deleted um, uveal melanoma, and that uh, study will be open at University of Miami in the next like um, um, few weeks or in the next few months. So that's what we have for the uveal melanoma. The treatment, the current treatment paradigm is still limited, but um, it's still uh, ongoing in terms of the research um, 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 investigation. So now I'm gonna just gonna give it back to Dr. Atkins for the Q and A. I did see a question in the chat, which um, I think uh, was interested in um, knowing what we can do for the 50% of patients with uh, BRAF 
wild type melanoma who don't respond to initial immunotherapies. And maybe Dr. Gibney, you might wanna comment on that. Sure, thank you, Dr. Atkins. And you know, we hope that they'll respond to either PD-1 by itself uh, or the combination with nivolumab, ipilimumab. So if the patient only received, for example, pembrolizumab, perhaps they would respond to the combination. But you know, if we're past that point, uh, we do have the TIL therapy, the, the adoptive transfer of the T cells that I was uh, discussing. Uh, there are other driver mutations where there are targeted therapy that uh, can be effective. Um, and then there's a number of clinical trial options uh, with new immunotherapy drugs where we have seen activity uh, and really just trying to hone in on those studies where uh, those will be developed further. For example, uh, the nivolumab or latlimab um, has been studied in, in patients after PD-1 uh, failure, and there are responders. So we do have other immunotherapy strategies like that that we would offer. And then another question, um, Dr. Gibney, um, maybe Dr. Rapiswan, in patients who progress after anti-PD-1 um, in either the metastatic setting, the monotherapy, or in the adjuvant setting, whether their answer for both the BRAF wild type and for the BRAF mutant population, what treatment should we be giving them? So, uh, so this is where they had a recurrence despite using a drug to prevent it. Yes. And uh, so, you know, you would hope they would have been cured from the drug. So if that didn't play out, you'd have to be concerned about re-challenging that patient with the same drug. So we usually are looking for an alternative class of therapy. So if um, the patient got uh, anti-PD-1 therapy by itself, maybe it would give combination. Um, or if they got a, had a BRAF mutation or, um, and they were on BRAF, or if they got immunotherapy and they had a BRAF mutation, then maybe it would give the BRAF MEK inhibitor combination uh, at relapse. Um, uh, Dr. Ravasun, you have other thoughts about that? Um, I agree with um, you, Dr. Gibney. Um, so um, um, another option would, um, when, when the patient has re already received the anti-PD-1 CTO, if uh, anti-PD-1 as an adjuvant treatment, we need to like, um, um, rethink about the, in the treatment strategy. Um, I often gear towards um, the the combination using the novel um, treatment in the clinical trial or um, see if like, you know, there is um, any other potential target that we can use. Okay. Um, another question for you, Dr. Gibney, is are there any TIL studies as first-line treatment and which patients should be directed to a TIL study instead of a guest checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy? So that's a very good uh, question. There are studies. In fact, a lot of the original data was in patients that had never seen an anti-PD-1 therapy. And we know the response rate is roughly about 50% in those patients. Um, we, we still don't know how to select well who will and will not respond to nivolumab, ipilimumab or anti-PD-1 monotherapy. We know who might have a slightly higher probability of response. Um, but it's hard to know who should go for TIL therapy as opposed to the anti-PD-1 therapy as their first choice. Um, we do have um, the IOVAN study open where it's combining a PD-1 drug with the TIL therapy as your frontline treatment. Uh, so there is interest in developing uh, TIL as a frontline therapy, um, but until we have better biomarkers, it's really hard to know who should get the TIL therapy uh, as their first line on a clinical trial. Um, in the future, if it's FDA approved, we might offer it to patients that have a contraindication to anti-PD-1 therapy. So uh, a good example would be someone who has a serious autoimmune disorder where giving anti-PD-1 therapy is something that we're, we would be concerned about, and we'd be less concerned with TIL therapy, yet both can produce very durable responses. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Gibney. So Dr. Mm -hmm. Rapiswan, could you please comment on... Um, pediatric uveal melanoma outcomes versus adult uveal melanoma outcomes? Is there any data? So um, the majority of the data from the uveal melanoma study were done in the adult. Um, in the pediatric population, we have not really been like um, 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 dive into um, this um, population yet, um, but um, the positive results from the study would 
certainly led to um, you know expansion of the patient population into pediatric population and when you look at the uh, uveal melanoma itself um, the uh, the majority of patients with uveal melanoma Uveal melanoma occurs in, in their 60, approximately less than 10% um, of them would, would develop in their 40. And patient, even with like germline BAP1 mutation, the median on, um, age of onset of their melanoma is typically like around like 30 or 40. Um, so um, the data in pediatric population is still like, quite um, um, not very good in terms of the treatment. Thank you. And one more question for you, Dr. Gibney. Is there research being done in the um, dosage or the amount of immunotherapy that um, um, is appropriate? Uh, so there have been studies looking at this. Um, we do know with PD-1 drugs, there is a good range of going higher and lower where you probably get very similar results. Um, and it may also be that you can go higher and dose it less frequently. So we've now seen that um, you can give a dose of pembrolizumab at a higher amount and it's relatively safe and it'll last six weeks uh, before that patient needs the next dose and hopefully you would achieve the same outcomes. Um, we have not seen if you give a higher dose of PD-1 drug necessarily that you get more response. Um, for the uh, drug ipilimumab, which is a CTLA-4 agent, there does appear to be a small dose response where if you give a higher dose, you might get a little bit higher response rate, but that's at the cost of more side effects. Um, so there's been movement actually trying to reduce the amount of the CTLA-4 drug you give to lower the risk of the side effects. And um, both in the combination with nivolumab and pembrolizumab, we've seen um, less toxicity when you give lower doses of ipilimumab, yet the response rate still looks pretty good. So we, we have been exploring different dose levels and certainly it can help with the side effects as well as maintaining the benefit for patients. And I would just point out as uh, Dr. Gibney presented that another way of uh, reducing the amount of immunotherapy that people are exposed to is the studies that are stopping therapy in the patients who likely have already had their disease go completely away. So, um, there's, I guess, one final question. Um, and is there, can anybody, maybe Dr. Gibney, you might want to talk about the progress in melanoma vaccines? Sure, I'd be happy to talk about that. We've participated in vaccine studies at Georgetown um, as investigators, uh, uh, Dr. Atkins, Dr. Rapasun, and I, um, largely in uh, the setting for melanoma to prevent recurrence. But we've also had trials um, where you're using it in combination with anti-PD-1 therapy to treat active disease. Um, there's movement towards giving personalized vaccines for melanoma, where you sequence the tumor of an individual patient and you figure out what proteins would be different in that tumor compared to the rest of the body and design their own personalized vaccine. Uh, so we've worked with the company Moderna and, and participated in an adjuvant study using that. We, um, we haven't seen the results yet, uh, so we've treated a number of patients and we thank them for their participation. Um, and we're hoping that we will see better outcomes in patients that got PD-1 plus vaccine as opposed to PD-1 alone. Um, but it's still a field that's kind of wide open. We aren't sure how much of a breakthrough this is going to be, but we're hopefully going to see some improvement in outcomes. Um, and it's interesting that the company Moderna and BioNTech that makes the Pfizer COVID vaccine um, were developing those um, RNA vaccines for um, mRNA vaccines for melanoma before they got um, distracted into the opportunity to develop vaccines for COVID. And so hopefully they'll come back and focus on their cancer vaccines once this pandemic is over. So um, I don't think, see any other questions. I hope um, we've uh, been able to teach you something about melanoma and melanoma therapy. And I hope um, it was useful and wish you all um, a good rest of your week.